It is March the 16th, no, 17th, 2021, and this is Curiously Polar. And we're back with another episode of this, well, very north and very south podcast. I still don't know how to call this. Do we have an official slogan or something? Not yet, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, this is okay. Uh, Never thought about that, <laughs> dear audience. What should our slogan be? One, like three words or something. Um, let us know. Let us know. This is your your chance to shine. <laughs> um, yeah, we are running amok today. Um, <laughs> well, not we, but something is running amok, and we'll have a closer look at that before we do. Um, two things. Um, first. If you don't know yet, or maybe you're watching this from a link on Twitter or something, um, we now have our own channel on YouTube, the Curiously Polar channel. It's all split out from the uh, from my private channel, from my own channel. So um, if you go there, it's at uh, curiouslypolar.com slash YouTube. We're going to put a link in the description. Make sure to subscribe there click all the but well actually actually <laughs> i do have uh you have prepared something i have a reminder for you <laughs> to um go there click the subscribe button click the bell click whatever you find it's it's going to help us it's going to be uh, help us to be more visible because that's the way to tell youtube that um that we exist so um give us a subscribe and uh, the advantages if you do that you will not be, uh, you will not be notified of anything else that I post, which might not be uh, interesting for you. So there we go. Unless That's... you're interested in photography as well, then you probably should be oh, if you're signing interested. up to all the other channels of uh, Chris as well. Yeah, but who's interested in photography? <laughs> so um, that's the first thing. And second thing is our newsreel. We do have a couple of news items. Um, a lot Let happened in the past two weeks in the Arctic and Antarctic. And what happened in the last two weeks? Is there anything of, of note that happened? Well, the first one, I think I want to talk about this big chunk of ice first. because um, Oh, yes, please. It is. Okay, A68 is in the past. I think we're That's not history. getting much more news. It's it's crumbling to smaller <laughs> pieces. So um, There are actually some some more news. It's actually uh, really interesting to, to follow um, the um, James Clark Ross mission, uh, the ship. Um, which is finished by now. The ship is on the on its way back, and it's the last um, mission for that ship after thirty years of service. This is going to be um, out of service then. But they are still, um, yeah, collecting the data and analyzing the data they just gathered around um, A sixty eight A. But a new iceberg has formed, and that's <laughs> okay. what we talked about in the last. <laughs> You're now allowed to forget about A68. It's A74 now, which means that <laughs> if they are consecutive, they have added the next nine, zero, one, two, three. This is the fifth uh, iceberg of note since A68 and it's A74. What uh, can we tell about that? Yeah, we talked about that in the um, in the past episode. That's a uh, uh, a massive piece of ice, 1,290 squ uh, square kilometer um, area. And the German icebreaker, Polarstern, uh, you remember it from the uh, infamous Mosaic expedition where yes. this icebreaker was just um, locked into ice for a year in the Arctic. Now it's in the Antarctic and it sailed around the iceberg. And what? if you're on YouTube, you see this what? gap. <laughs> You see this gap of <laughs> the iceberg and the brown like ice shelf. It's like a few hundred meters wide, and they were just they just it's went. Still, oh, let's have a look. It's inside. less than five hundred meters on its yeah. closest, and then you have, of course, all the brash and all the the bigger um, icebergs that break out from the large piece. That's it's not, just there's a certain level of danger, right? They're still carving pieces of the of the edges, so. Um, why on? Okay, well they are they're scientists, so I guess that's one of the reasons the, why they did this. But the interesting thing is, um, on the edge of the iceberg, where it's just carved from the from the ice shelf, where you have the little um, lead, the gap between the ice shelf and the new iceberg, there you can gather some some data, which is very very difficult to gather because mm -hmm. most of those big icebergs, they actually carve in an environment where you have a lot of sea ice around, which are very, very little accessible for ships. And having this icebreaker there and just going between the iceberg and the ice shelf 
gives the scientists the opportunity to collect some data which is unique and very, very rare to understand how, for example, um, phytoplankton um, develops under the ice shelf. Okay, so it is a scientific endeavor. They're not just going there for, for the fun of it. By the way, BBC News, they have this photo here on and you see the enlargement of like a few pixels down there which is the polar <laughs> stern you can see this on the right bottom of this picture so you gives you a bit of an idea how big everything is there i mean this is not just a chunk of ice that you can put in a glass of whiskey that is a sizable sizable iceberg i mean just just look at the at the bottom of that ice bar the the, the tiny where it almost looks like the iceberg still touches the the ice shelf and that's, that's like 500 <laughs> meters it's half a kilometer <laughs> <laughs> this is crazy. Okay, so that is the first piece of news. Um, I'm pretty sure A74 will be with us for uh, for a while. Um, second piece of news is kind of bizarre, I think. I believe it's super bizarre. Um, Polar wow. Journal has brought us uh, brought our attention to this. Um, it is a new hotel that opens in China, and it's a polar bear hotel. What? The it's heck? super disturbing, I have to, to admit. It's a it's a small version of a zoo, and it has it, it's a hotel that's uh, built around a polar bear cage. And from every that room in the so hotel, crazy. you are supposed to be able to see the polar bears through bulletproof glass. And it's not only the fact that you build a hotel around uh, to um, captivated polar bears. The other fact is that the whole setup of that hotel, it has it, it's just sprouting out of kitsch. There's well, nothing realistic on that. That I think that that might have to do with the with the cultural sensibilities of uh, other cultures. So I I wouldn't fail them for that. But um, holding polar bears captive uh, is a thing utterly to, wrong. It's it's utterly wrong, and uh, holding them captive with like with rooms around to watch I, this is weird this is just plain weird okay. the, re the media response around the planet um just mirrors that exactly it's and a big um, wtf yeah mm -hmm. exactly <laughs> the outcry in social media as well so um <sighs> it's just it's it's good that it's pointed out um that we're aware of um such developments but um yeah no recommendation to go there at all yeah i think if i had the choice i would probably I will probably not go. Um, let's get to the topic of this episode, which is Amok. What is Amok? Amok. Exactly. What Amok? is Amok? Okay, so um, uh, it's an acronym. I mean, that far I know, but what does it stand for and why is it important? <laughs> exactly. The easy answer here is it stands for the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, AMOC. Well, now I know everything. Thank you. That and, was it for today's news. <laughs> <laughs> and publicly known is um, the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation as the Gulf Stream system. Ah. It entails more than just the Gulf Stream, but the Gulf Stream is kind of the most um, famous part of it. And that's why the entire AMOC usually in public media just gets abbreviated as Gulf Stream system because no ordinary citizen knows the term amok or um, has a clue what an overturning circulation means. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, in short, the amok is a large system of uh, ocean currents that carry warm water from lower latitudes around the equator um, nor northwards um, into the North Atlantic. The long answer describes the um, a mock as zonally integrated component of highly complex, huge three-dimensional flow systems of surface and deep currents. So we have different layers within the ocean. We always think a little bit about the ocean as um, the currents are created by wind, the wind um, on top of the ocean. And that is partly true because much, much more of the motion of the ocean happens due to different salinity levels and those different salinity levels change the density of water that's uh, like an episode on its own just talking about um, density of water and how, it, how that changes but in short the changing density creates heavier and lighter water and by that 
um, a convection, and that convection in different layers creates different cells in the ocean, and thus we have actually different ocean currents on different levels in the ocean. We don't only have the surface current, but we have a, a number of um, underlying um, currents there as well. The whole um, system of salt, water, mixture, um, the whole circulation system behind the more dense and less dense is called uh, thermohaline uh, circulation, which originates from thermo and haline. We we'll also get into that a little later, but um, that's like the yeah the the longer explanation of that. Right. And we have here's a here's a picture by Hugo Alenius uh, from Norway who um, has this online. So this is yeah this looks like a this looks a bit like a like a map for a roller coaster. It actually is, and that's a very simplified map because. When we talk about ocean currents, we could go into detail here. That would keep us busy for weeks. Um, but we have like the major currents. And you can see one uh, factor, and that's that all the ocean currents are interconnected. And the um, Gulf Stream system is no um, exception from that. So you can see you have red and blue lines. The red lines are actually um, surface water, warm surface water that comes from the tropical regions. And um, that tenden uh, yeah, in the tendency uh, flows north, and in the north it cools down, um, particularly also in the, in the Southern Ocean, by the way. And uh, when it cools down, it gets denser, heavier, it sinks down to the bottom, and then we have the bottom stream, which is here the, the blue lines, the bottom cold water that actually um, then drives back. And that's kind of a conveyor belt, because... The warm water, it gets colder, it gets heavier, it sinks down, and then it flows back. It follows the bathymetry, it follows currents, it follows uh, a, a number of factors that are aligned between the fact of how much salt is in the water, how warm, how cold is it, and then obviously also follows the bathymetry on the seafloor. It's a really interesting system to look into. We today won't focus on the Atlantic Ocean here, and in particular on the North Atlantic Ocean. So, looking just just looking at the map, so so what we call the Gulf Stream um, is what keeps Great Britain, for example, warmer than the rest because the warm currents move past that. Is that correct? Yeah. If you if you look at this picture, you see that Great Britain is pretty much on the same latitude that. Uh, than a big chunk of Siberia. And Siberia mm -hmm. is significantly colder than the British Isles. And the same goes for, for Iceland. Look um, on, on what latitude Iceland is um, compared to, for example, the same latitudes in Greenland. And just look how different the landscapes are. The reason for that, of course, are the different ocean currents bringing warm water um, into the area and then um, exchanging that for, for cold water. So that's like the, the major factor here. And that's one of the main reasons why we talk a little bit about running a mock today. Um, I would love to explain a little bit the Gulf Stream more in detail and how it works. And then going into the actual question of why is it actually running a mock and what does that really mean to us? And I would just love to start with explaining a little bit how does an ocean work? Shall we dive in there? Absolutely. So we have ocean currents and, and wind systems, and they transport heat from the equator to towards the poles. And th there they operate like a large engine for, for global climate. So we have numerous uh, currents in the ocean, and the so-called conveyor belt is then um, turning into a very, very important system in the climate. Um, this term, um, conveyor belt, describes the combination of current that results in four of the five global oceans which are interconnected here and the 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 form they they form together this um circulation system which is then called thermohaline circulation based on the temperature and the salt content in the water and both of those factors the temperature and the salinity they determine the density of water and if you ever had um physics classes in school you might remember the very special feature that um that uh, lake water or fresh water has um having its um largest density at four degrees celsius 
It means when a, a lake freezes over, um, it stopped having that con uh, convection, having that exchange of cold and warm water, and the cold water actually stays on top and it's not sinking down any longer because at four degree, it is so heavy that the cold water can't replace it anymore. So it starts freezing over on the surface and then it takes usually longer time to freeze all the way to the bottom before it then, um, uh, due to spring, starts melting again. That property is one of the reasons why fish survive in winter because they, exactly. have, they have a warmer layer of water uh, lower at the at the bottom of the lake. Yeah, Salt water behaves differently because the salt... Um, slows down that process uh, tremendously. And we have this uh, con convection zone between fresh water and, and salt water, which is called brackish water. And from there on, we have the behavior that ocean water has. And while the masses of water may be moved in part by wind, Primarily, the different densities of the global oceans are the, the factor that's responsible for the movement. So having different um, density in the water means we have different weight, and that's when they lift it up or just um, drag down, and that um, creates the uh, conveyor belt. The water's density also increases with a higher um, salt content, obviously. So it's not only temperature, it's also um, salt coming in. So at the equator... The heat from the sun, um, that actually is strong enough to result in a lot of evaporation. And if the water is taken out of the equation, the salinity, so the amount of salt in the in the ocean just increases. And by that, it just um, sinks down. Does that make sense so far? Absolutely. So that's where the story of the Gulf Stream begins. So now we have like the general overview of oceans, how they work. And now we have a little closer look to the Gulf Stream system. So the Gulf Stream in general is very, very important for the European climate. We have pointed that out with the examples of, um, for example, the British Isles or Iceland, but you can also take uh, France. France largely profits from um, the, the Gulf Stream, from the temperatures the, the Gulf Stream brings in. Without that, France or Central Europe in general would be up to five degrees colder. That's a significant uh, temperature drop, a huge difference here, and that would change um, the way we would live in Central Europe uh, tremendously. The length of um, the Gulf Stream is about 10,000 kilometers. That's a huge, humongous number. It's one of the largest and fastest flowing currents um, on the planet. And it is very, very warm. So it heats up in the Gulf of Mexico, where it goes up to 30 degrees Celsius. So that's that's fairly warm. So my fiance usually uh, tells me she's only going into the water if the water temperature is above 25 degrees Celsius. So that would be certainly her paradise. However, one of the fastest flowing currents on Earth, that means that at a speed of roughly two meters per second, that brings up to 100 million cubic meters of water per second towards Europe. What? A hundred <laughs> million cubic meters. Cubic meter? Per second. You're, you're blowing my mind again, okay. Yes, that's just very, very difficult to comprehend. It's just a number to to, to, to drop. Um, we put it in the show notes. Um, please cross-check that. It's humongous, the amount of water. And obviously, you're not placing uh, four people in the ocean measuring that just by catching water or putting a current meter in there. It's, of course, underlying statistical models here. So that's uh, very tricky. We have a video from NASA, however, that shows us a little bit more of the Gulf Stream and how it actually works. And the, again, the visualization studio of NASA um, does an amazing job. So the turning of the Earth, actually, and the west wind drift uh, directs the Gulf Stream from the uh, Gulf of Mexico, where the name origins from, um, towards Europe, and then it splits up into... Uh, you see it in the lower part of the video um, that goes towards the Canary Islands. And then we have one part that flows north into the North Atlantic current. And the third part actually um, yeah, mingles, a bit, uh, yeah, mingles a bit around. The water here becomes colder. You see it in the temperature. It turns from um, orange-yellowish towards green-bluish. And the salt content and the density 
that rises on the account of evaporation and then drops again when it's far enough north between Greenland, Norway and Iceland. So up there in the far, far north, that's where we have a big part of that exchange and even further north. One of the reasons why Longyearbyen, for example, in, in, in Svalbard is accessible for a large part of the year is because the last remains of the Gulf Stream reach all the way up. They pass by on, on Spitsbergen and enter the Arctic Ocean and then yeah, sink down there, cool down, and then the um, cold deep water flows back so, through the Fram Strait. Well, this this shows me two things. First of all, I'm I'm more and more in awe of the NASA's <laughs> visualization studio because they are doing such a tremendous job. And the second is what we just looked at before was a very, very simplified version of this. There's a lot of turbulence going on, a lot of meandering in different areas, different directions. You have a lot of, a lot of eddies. And um, yes. there, there are a number of factors, as I said in the beginning, that really um, come together here that actually influence um, how an ocean current moves and where it goes to and why it changes. It's not a constant thing, right? It changes through a number of factors. And that makes the whole system so incredibly complex. And I like to keep uh, that in mind for a later part of the episode when we are coming back why the AMOC is running amok. However, in the North Atlantic deep water, um, we have very special features, and that is formed in the Greenland and Norwegian seas. That means north of, uh, of Norway and east of Greenland, north of Iceland. In that um, triangle, we have the, the majority of the North Atlantic deep water form. That means the warm water from the, uh, from the Gulf of Mexico uh, cools down so much that it actually gets denser, that it gets heavier and sinks down. And that's the biggest part of the plumbing system of the ocean. When it gets dragged down, it also changes direction and then the water spills over a rim of the ridge that stretches between Greenland, Iceland and then further on to Scotland and you have a map from 1968 that shows an amazing um, level of details of the bathymetry of the Atlantic Ocean. And you perfectly see the Mid-Atlantic Ridge reaching from the south all the way to Iceland and further north. But I would love to, to highlight your uh, look between Greenland and Iceland. And you see there is a very deep basin that actually um, emerges from the shelf of Greenland and the socket of Iceland. And that's the big, big um, process where the water just runs down, the cold water runs down that ridge that creates what's um, very often described as the largest waterfall of uh, on Earth. They are um, in uh, geographically terms called chimneys and they're roughly 15 kilometer wide pillars and the water falling down there down to 4,000 meters. And again, you remember the 100 million cubic meters of water per second that runs down the Gulf Stream? 17 million cubic meter of water per second run down there. That's roughly 15 times more water than is carried by all the rivers together in the world. That's just <laughs> unfathomable. It's just incredibly large amounts of, of water. Wow. But you see, there's also a very, very big um, drift down there so you you really have kind of a convective plumb going down there and that goes then on the western side of the um of the atlantic left off the mid-atlantic ridge it goes down all the way to south america where it then enters into the southern ocean and then the conveyor belt starts again and then the warm water is um injected into the south atlantic um west of uh, south africa just goes up and then where South America and Africa um, have the smallest gap. That's where the warm water, the surface water, actually um, changes from east to west and then enters the Gulf of Mexico and then the Gulf Stream starts all over again. Just the very basics on the Gulf Stream here. This huge maelstrom up there in, in Greenland that constantly pulls the new water. That's the reason that this Gulf Stream moves constantly towards Europe. So that's like the, the big plumbing in the system. And the flow southwards then 
uh, were pressed against the western edge of the North Atlantic. And it just, it's an incredibly complex, but also a very, very fascinating um, system. And so I highly... Just, just a thing to highlight here, and, and I wasn't... I wasn't fully aware why these eddies were forming the way they were until I saw this chart because it makes it very clear that the the underwater mountains and these ridges um, yes. are a very important part. It's like rivers flowing in on 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 a surface, right? So and you have so much so much in, uh, inputs there. You have the fresh water coming from the rivers. Um, yes. You have the continental shelf where the water drops down in in altitude, and we're talking about mountain ranges of altitude 4000 yes. meters oh, that's yeah. half the size of mount everest it's humongous huge it's valleys really down there yes. and 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 re really like a like a big slide in which those uh, currents are being guided around so that makes a lot more sense all of a sudden thank you for sharing this so and then good. you have and, and thanks and thanks to mapscaping who has put this on twitter this is amazing yeah indeed and then you have the fresh water coming in the fresh water Obviously, no, not containing any salt, so that changes the, the salinity. Then you have cold water coming from uh, from the northern and the southern latitudes, changing the density as well. So you have a lot of inputs there that affects how fast uh, currents are going, how water uh, movement is changing, and so on. It is super, super interesting. It's really incredible, and countless species actually use, use the Gulf Stream as their means of transport. Right, so they they travel from the Caribbean to to northern areas using the um yeah, the currents of, of the sense, Gulf Stream, yeah. just saving energy. It's it's really incredible, but it's not only that it brings us animals, the enormous quantity of warm air that comes with it. That's one of the reasons why we have such a um favorable climate in Europe, and scientists have calculated how much that actually is and in order to produce the same heat that the gulf stream brings to the shores of europe we would need and now comes another unfathomable number one million nuclear power plants to create the same energy the same heat in europe that's just incredible the energy in that system is something we certainly don't understand fully it's yes, incredible, yes. really. That's one of the major reasons why the Gulf Stream is called the heat pump. Because for Europe, this is existential. Without the Gulf Stream, no chance of having higher life in Europe. The temperatures would be at least 5 to 10 degrees lower. And that's just something uh, when we talk about climate change goals of reaching 1.5 to 2 degrees um just considering 5 to 10 degrees lower uh, temperatures we are talking about catapulting us back 10,000 years where we have um the last glaciation period we don't want to go there do we we don't want to go there not really okay no. so what is happening with the gold stream right now because I think one of the reasons we're doing this is because the Gulf Stream is not behaving quite as it did for a long time. Indeed. So in the last few years, um, a lot of scientists um, have came up with uh, the fear that the Gulf Stream could um, weaken and come to a standstill. The so media has picked that up and turned that into the day after tomorrow narrative that this, uh, the, the Gulf Stream just st uh, stops immediately. And um, from one day to the other, we would have humongous ice sheets um, all over uh, the world again. And that's due to climate change. And then you have a lot of people who have difficulties to comprehend that um, uh, increasing temperature on the planet actually could lead to a new ice age, if you like. It's a big to digest here. However, everything of that revolves around the question of whether the Gulf Stream has already weakened or not. And here we have some very, very recent uh, studies. Climate models predicted for quite some time that this will be one of the consequences of um, the global warming we have induced, alongside obviously other problems such as rising sea levels and increasing heat waves and droughts and extreme precipitation. 
there is a lot of factors coming in, but is the slowdown already underway today? What do you think? Uh, I would certainly expect so. I mean, the, the amount of energy that we are putting into this system by burning fossil fuels, by changing the equation of warming and cooling in terms of the uh, the CO2 content rising, which is like a warming blanket over the Earth. I believe that we have uh, already influenced that system quite substantially. And that's you and me. But we both know scientists struggle a lot to make an ultimate statement, and rightly so. It's very well known that research results are only as good as the data on which they are based on, right? And True. that also reflects the current state of knowledge, and this obviously can change. That's a difficulty a lot of people have with science, that scientists are not going there and just say, that's how it is, because that's not what science is for. What a scientist would say is that how we interpret the data as of now. And as soon as someone comes up with a new theory and can base that on um, scientific evidence, the whole thing just tumbles. So we start from scratch there. However, we also accept that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, for example, is um, a body that respects the shortcoming and uh, the limitations of science, right? It's something that's kind of common sense. So generally speaking, the forecasts of the IPCC are largely considered rather, let's say, conservative, which means that the panel would formulate rather cautiously and would not really support alarmist um, research papers or alarmist messages. It evaluates very, very object uh, objectively on the basis of what kind of research papers have been published in the past years. And then they assess that, assign appropriate categories such as it is very likely that this and that happened or it's rather unlikely. So they have um, very objective um, formulations, if you like, depending on how often um, a certain statement has been supported by other papers. And now we're looking back a few years to the special report on the impact of global warming um, of 1.5 degrees, which came out in 2018. And already there, the IPCC condenses the research in that field um, to the assessment that it is more likely than not that the AMARC has been rearing a weakening in recent decades. And goes then even further stating that evidence of a slowdown of a mock has increased since the fifth assessment report on climate change from 2014. So we already have data from 2014 and 2018 shows that the weakening actually is happening. At the same time, the IPCC highlights that the weakening of the AMARC of the Gulf Stream system is projected to be highly disruptive to natural and human systems. And that's obviously no surprise after you've seen how much impact, how much energy, how much force is behind there. It's really an incredibly complex system. And the IPCC, as a very conservative player here, already warns about a likelihood. They, however, put it into a formulation, it is more likely than not. So that's a 55-45 chance, if you would translate that into numbers. Some scientists, however, like Professor Ramster from the German Institute of Climate Impact, in, uh, Climate Impact Research in, in, in Potsdam, even argue for a less conservative wording, changing the more likely than not into something like very likely. Because the research results around the globe, they show clearly and very, very much undisputed that the Gulf Stream system has already significantly weakened since the last uh, late 19th century. And we see more decline happening. And we actually can also identify that most of that decline that has been identified can actually be directed into the time span of the mid 20th century till today. So a very, very short time of 60, 70 years. Interestingly enough, I today came across um, a 40-year-old piece in the Tagesschau, which is a 
traditional German news program, kind of the most important one. And uh, they were reporting from the World Climate Conference in Geneva in 1979. Again, 40 years ago and uh, pretty much is along the lines of what's happening right now. So the science uh, community back then already warned that uh, this might have the consequences that it is having right now. And uh, that includes yeah, the world climate, where which the Gulf Stream is a very important and big part of. So, And then you have two different factions. You have um, the scientists who are not media people, who are not advertisers, who are not promoters. They're doing research, yeah. they're public research papers. But they are opposed by an army of public relations professionals who are mm -hmm. countering for certain reasons, and that would be a complete different episode on its own, um, they counter the science behind that. They raise skepticism behind the, the science There's and so on. There's a good book out there. Or is, it, or is it a film, Merchants of Doubt? It's both, it's, actually. Yes, uh, very, it's, very it's good. It's worth watching or reading because yes. it exactly talks about these kind of things, these, um, let's say, concerted efforts to change the public narrative. I read it a number of times and I'm I'm getting super angry every single time I read it. And it's just you're getting more angry and angry from chapter to chapter. It's really something anyhow let's go back to the science <laughs> <laughs> sorry i had to bring this one up okay, okay. completely right and and very much yes. related so um just three weeks back so not too long ago a group of scientists around professor rumsterv and left Cassisa from the university in ireland but also part of the climate um, impact research institute in potsdam they published the most recent paper on on this particular issue of amok and they compiled actually a range of different um, historical reconstructions of the amok so they actually looked at already existing and published data they call it proxy data so it's actually you access previous scientific research so someone else has um already gathered data and you look just for different um hints than they previously did so they compiled this data and um, analyzed it and they reconstructed the history of the Gulf Stream system and they dated it back 1600 years that's a long time for making scientific predictions of how the ocean currents um, have behaved considering how complex the whole system is and you've seen that in um, in, in the videos how many eddies you have how many in, uh, influxes you have how many impacts it, it actually has just a very very complex system so Dating that back or projecting it back 1,600 years is a tremendous effort. They, the data they they actually um, um, released, they represent very very different facets of uh, of the Gulf Stream, and that's the uh, flow speed, that's water masses, and heat transport, like the the three main factors. Unfortunately, these data their uh, data very clearly show that the amok is declining significantly in the 20th century with the weakest amok state of the whole series in the last decades. So in the last few decades, we have the weakest state of the Gulf Stream system in the 1,600 years period they projected. This is a very interesting statement here. This new study sh um, delivers... Um, kind of a scientific milestone in actually delivering scientific evidence that the Gulf Stream is slowing down. So it actually takes out the um, suggestion level or the rumor level out of media um, attention on that. It takes out the um, uh, the Hollywood part of, um, of, of this um, scenario of uh, day after tomorrow, but it actually bases it on scientific evidence and for the vast majority of scientists that's not coming by any surprise right so climate models as you just shown um in the news snippet from uh from from germany they predicted that to happen already decades ago and in fact the gulf stream system is presently in its weakest state for more than a thousand years that's just published in, in nature um magazine uh, just three weeks ago Major consequences here, apart from just regional cooling, could, of course, also include an increase in major floods and storms. And we go even further, it could mean a collapse of plankton stocks because all those ocean currents are 
interconnected. They are feeding certain ecosystems. Ecosystems, ecotypes are particularly specialized on certain conditions. If they ch change, then the whole ecosystem changes and might collapse. Warming or rainfall changes in the tropics or Alaska and Antarctica might occur. That means we can actually see, for example, that in the North Pacific, where we have the transition between North Pacific and Bering Sea, we, we see increased rainfall because more uh, participation associated to, um, to the currents. That's a huge connection here um, through the entire thermal line circulation system, not mentioning um, the oceanic anoxic event where we actually lose a lot of um, oxygen in the in the ocean might be com even completely depleted and is one of the probable causes of past mass extinction events according to a number of scientists so there is the the major news that the gulf stream current already has slowed down so we can see that there are a number of interesting side effects happening but we also see that if that process continues then we are facing a severe problem in uh, northern europe but eventually for the whole world's climate and that's just a, a very interesting um factor to actually get scientific evidence on and now i'm just really curious how the rest of the science uh, scientific community reacts to that and also how that affects the next assessment uh, report of the IPCC. So obviously scientists have different views on the impact that climate change will have on the global ocean conveyor belt. But one thing um, is kind of clear. So when the climate changes, then obviously also the complex system of the ocean currents and wind um, will change in ways that we don't understand yet. And that is something we always have to consider since this whole system has been very, very stable since the last ice age for the last 10, 11, 12,000 years. That's like the, the major outcome out of this new study. <sighs> okay, well, that's, let's, I don't know, let's what? Let's what? <laughs> <laughs> this is a very good question. Um, so the world's climate, very much connected with the Gulf Stream, is changing. And uh, I, th I think we'll have to be very, very watchful for what is going to be said and shown in the media, um, especially the things that start casting doubt on this, because that is a well-known pattern that has happened in so many contexts, uh, be it be it um, smoking, cigarette consume, um, and now the climate. Uh, I think the, the, the term climate change, I'm putting air quotes over this, is a result of some of these, yes. um, these things because climate change sounds so much nicer than climate catastrophe, climate disaster, climate... Um, crisis. Crisis, breakdown, whatever. So mm -hmm. um, let's all keep our antennas up and try to... Um, yeah, try to understand what's going on there and especially um, try to listen in on the voices and on the tonalities and things. I think that's unfortunately one important. tendency that um, has shown up in the past 10, 15 years, if not even longer, is that those um, capacities invested in raising skepticism on, on that have actually caused a huge mistrust of scientific data, of scientific bodies. And if you don't trust the science behind it, which is peer reviewed, by the way, that means that other scientists of that field with their expertise are checking if the way you are researching, if the data you collected and the, the process you evaluated that data and came to a conclusion is actually professional if that's the case and if you don't trust that system what and kind of option do we have 
and eroding trust is one of the methods. So yes. um, we are we are beginning to see the results, and we arguably have seen them very strongly over the last four years and longer. So anyway, with that, <laughs> we'll, we'll come back in a week from now. Don't forget, uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, to subscribe, to hit the buttons, the usual suspects, the bell and everything. And of course, um, yeah, make sure to follow us on the social media. We are at Curiously Polar on uh, Insta, on Twitter. We have our website, curiouslypolar.com, where you can find all the other pff, five million episodes that we've already done. And um, yeah, with that, I think we are getting ready to close on to close on this episode and come up with more news. We'll also keep an eye on the icebergs and things. Bye-bye. Till next time. <laughs>